Are, are, all the football movies were downhill after North Dallas 40. I don't know if you watched North Dallas 40. I, I have, yes. yes. It's, it's pretty that's good. All you need. There's not many good football movies. I, yeah. I'll, 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 I'm with you on that, definitely. Oh, that's right, baby. This is the best football movie going, right? <laughs> that's right. Two random white guys with white sneakers <laughs> sitting at a desk, okay, talking about football. Sounds good to me. I mean, North Dallas 40 is really good. Awesome. Really good. So real. You know, I mean, just while we're on the topic, because now you got me thinking, Rudy yeah. was awesome. I'm a it big fan great. of Rudy. Still cry. Uh, I agreed. Yeah. Rudy's special, special movie. Yeah. I got a chance to really meet Rudy uh, when I was playing in the NFL for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I kind of had to host an event yeah. that he was being honored at or whatever. How was he? Which was very I, I've cool. Heard mixed, I've heard mixed reviews. Well, I could see the mixed reviews part of it. He was yeah. great to me. You know, he's got a very strong – you know, very confident in himself, personality. Mm -hmm. And, yes, I've heard some of those mixed reviews, too, where yeah. he's rubbed people the wrong way or whatever else. But uh, either way, that's an amazing story. We're missing some other football movies that I'm blanking out on right now. I actually wrote a couple down. Yeah. Uh, I know Pete's telling me something, but All the Right Moves, Tom Cruise, about 1983-84. You're right. With Amp Coach. Pipe against Walnut Heights, Coach Nickerson. Yes. Give me a real cry, Sal Vucci. I mean, that's. That's, that's a pretty good one. You're right. Yeah. I always forget about that, that one. Out. Right, yeah. Uh, what's the, you know, Sean Penn's brother. What's his name? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, in the movie, he was going to USC. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. the late great. I he think he's no longer with us. I think us, you're exactly right. He, paid a, he played that part perfect, like the meathead, cool He was that cool linebacker, 6'2 stack monster. 6'2 right. stack <laughs> monster. Yeah, that was him. Yes. What movie did you say, Pete? Remember oh, the Titans? You're right. Yeah. I mean, remember the right Titans. On. I got a lot of crap about that one. Because? Because there was a lefty quarterback who was blonde. Oh, so that has yeah. to be Chris That's Sims. Right. So I became Sunshine. Yeah. At Texas, we were <laughs> that stuck. Huh? We well, we used to go to the movies the night before games. Yeah, right. And I believe I can't remember who we we're gonna play, but one of the Friday nights we went to see Friday night or uh, uh, what the hell's the name of the movie? Remember, uh, the, remember Titans. the Titans, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm Friday Night Lights. I was in Texas. Okay, give me a second here. But yeah, I went to go see that, and you know, of course, that kid took over, and my team in the middle of the movie theater was like, "Sam, sunshine," <laughs> and I never had, I never heard the end of that crap. Do, yeah. do you remember the? Uh, was it Anthony Michael Hall, dude who was in Sixteen Candles with like? Was it Johnny B. Good? Oh. Or something late '80s, a highly recruited quarterback. You're right. It is yeah. Johnny B. Good. Okay. I, I, it is. I, I can't remember that real. There's some funny parts, but I right. was kind of young at that point. I don't know. I didn't watch that one as yeah, much. It was, it was pretty average. Yeah, pretty good. Keep uh, the football movie ideas coming because I mean, there, there's a lot of them I can't remember. I know yeah. there's better ones out there. Any, Any given, given Sunday. Sunday eh. right. Okay. The longest, longest yard's a yard classic. Is great. I mean, yeah. the, the classic, or the, even the new version, is not bad. Yeah. All right, it's not the classic. Michael Irvin was in that. I think thing. I broke his <laughs> neck. I think yeah. I broke his. I mean, those are those are classics. Yeah. Um, what's what's the other one at the college level? Uh, the program. No, the program. Oh, the program. I, I hate movies like the program and any given Sunday. That aren't. It's not realistic. It's not. It's right? like they took like every story that was bad about a player yeah. in the history of the NFL and they put it in a movie for an hour and a half where yeah. this guy abuses, you know, everything, drugs. He's a meathead. He's a drinker. He, you know, does steroids. It's like every story you've heard in over the history of time. Exactly. And they put it in a movie and make it like this is every football yeah. player. And I want to be like, no. F you, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little whiff of football in Revenge of the Nerds. Oh. They filmed it down there at the University You're of right. Arizona, and the, the guys were on the football team yes. doing all the, all the meathead football guy kind right. of things. Right, right. Yes, I John do remember Goodman that, too. Coach. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie as well. Man, yeah. look at you. All right. All right. I am, I am derailing this Let's thing. go. You're not derailing anything. We two, got football. Two minutes in. We got DTs to talk about. We got some AMA questions to, to answer. A lot of those. Yep. Defensive tackles one day after offensive line. So on, a, on an interior week at the Sims house, you, like, put on a flannel. You're not shaving. You, like, eat food on the couch. Like, do you get down with the interior mindset? I told my wife to make some pasta and meatballs because exactly. I'm watching the big guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I do. It does. It is fun to watch. I will say O-line can be a little more tedious. Mm. I said this yesterday on the podcast, just as far as, you know, you, you got to really watch and study O-linemen. And, and, you know, of course, there's, you know, the competition who you're playing. Some games you're not asked to do as much, all of that. D-tackles is fun. You just put on, you know, a lot of the times what I do is I put the all-22 on, always. I mean, it's all-22, but I mean, what I'm saying is that side view. 
Mm. I watch a few plays just to see them from that view, and then I really make it all end zone cuts. And I just look at their big butts on my screen and watch them get off and <laughs> dominate people, and I, I enjoy that. So uh, it, it's, it's a fun watch. It really is. D tackles are always fun for me. And D tackles to me in the NFL, you know, a, a lot of the times the difference in the really great defenses in football and sometimes the best personalities in your oh, locker yeah. room. That's where I loved, like, the defensive tackles. Miss I mean, those guys, Oh, right? man, I was around some great ones. I mean, of course, Warren Sapp and Booger yeah, McFarlane. Yeah. You know, that was special to, to hear them talk always and Warren always talking that. I was with Albert Hainsworth of the Tennessee Titans when he was in his prime. You know, that was cool. There was a lot of personalities there. Chris Hovan, you remember him? Yeah, You know, big yeah. jack white guy from Boston mm-hmm. College. Yep. I mean, uh, I respect the tackles because they're usually – you know, like I've always said, they're, they're bulls. Yeah. They're angry bulls that are just looking for someone to say the wrong thing to them, to fight right. or get in a confrontation. And, uh, yeah, I, I, they have great work ethic, usually a great motor. You know, that, that's what's interesting about the animal yes. of the defensive tackle. I, I used to work, uh, when I worked at NFL Network, Warren Sapp was there for a while. Sure. And if I knew Warren was going to be in the production meeting on the show that night, it was just a, it was a different feel pulling into work. I'm like, right. oh, Warren's going to be in the meeting today. Okay. I kind of had to go in with that mindset that it was going to be a Warren. It's going to be day. a different day. Yeah, exactly not only right. on, the, on the show that night, but just in the whole day leading up to it. No it doubt. A, it had a fun flavor to it, but yeah. it, was, it, it was different. <laughs> you definitely, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure. You weren't going to approach that like you were everybody else. There, right. That's for sure. Sap is, uh, you know, again, people can think what they want about him or whatever. First off, he's phenomenal. He's arguably the best defensive tackle in the history of football, you know, an unreal personality, loves Huge football, personality, yeah. loves football, really does, loves sports in general. I mean, I used to, even during the winter time, go hang out with Sapp and, mm-hmm. and, and a few other defensive players, and we'd go watch NBA basketball and hang out and do that type of stuff. I used to love it. I really did. Um, did I ever told you my Sapp story? Uh-oh. I mean, just my, we might as well go there yeah. real quick. I don't think Pete's ever even heard this either. This is the first time, right? Yeah. I'm drafted by Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. It's one of my first days in the building. It's my first day in the building with the whole team there, or most of the team there. And I've been in Gruden's office. He's kind of, you know, I'm I'm a rookie, of course, and he's going to teach me a few plays that I got to do today. And he's giving me the lay of the land on little things. And, you know, then he's, hey, you know, Gabe, man, hey, when you walk in that locker room, go around, meet some of those veterans, all right? Stick your hand out. Tell them it's great to meet them and all that stuff. So I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, this is going to be advice. awesome. And they just won the Super Bowl. Yeah. And I'm a fanboy anyways. So right. I'm already like, I can't wait to see these guys. Yeah. This is going to be amazing. Old shitty one buck place in Tampa. The right? old one. The old one. Right. Where there was unidentified funguses on the floor <laughs> and dead rats just crawling and dying in the middle of the floor. Okay. And the ticket sales was in a trailer and all those things. And the walls were paper thin. And we had like seven working showers sometimes where mm. it's like, wait, we have 90 guys here. We have seven showers. Like what? But so I bust through the door, double open door, right? Come through the locker room. First guy I see, I mean, standing right there, Saps locker was like one of those lockers where you walk through the big entrance and it was about at your 11 o'clock, right? Okay. He was right there. And I go, oh, damn, there's Warren Sapp. This guy I wanted to meet the most. I can't wait. I stick my hand out like John Gruden says. And he goes, get the f- out of my <laughs> face. Get the f- out of here. No, don't even talk to me until you played the game or even won a game. You know? And I was so like, sh- I was just really, I, I'm not going to lie, I was probably as embarrassed right. as I've ever been in my life. Because the, the nervous level heading in <laughs> right. was all-time high anyway, and, right? I'm, I'm already at a place. Yeah. I'm like, who are these guys? And this crazy coach just talking to me and Gruden. And he did that. You want to talk about like knocking the cool out of your walk? Like, yeah. I didn't know what to do after that. I just walked away and walked to my locker real uncomfortable. You think Gruden set you up? I, you- I did think that. I think I was like, when I got done, and I've always said that, I was like, I think Gruden knew exactly what I was walking Have into. You ever asked him? Uh, I don't think I ever did ask him, but, yeah. it, but it was awesome. And then, but yet there was the reverse side of guys like Simeon Rice, who was the exact opposite, mm-hmm. who would have been like, hey, Pimpin, come over here. Talk to me. <laughs> hey, it's nice to meet you, man. And then, that, you know, that would have made me feel better Rondé Barber was that way but yeah that yeah. team was loaded loaded goodness. Brooks yeah yeah Rondé John, John Lynch. Lynch I know it's loaded I mean they're one of the greatest defenses ever no doubt about that as for the actual task at hand here yeah. draft Sorry. rankings yeah and we I, I like this formula we've settled into we kind of warm up to the actual rankings 
you get a lot of responses based off of the whatever top five you've been through the, yes. the last time uh, or the last couple of weeks. So I want to hit some questions about some of the rankings you've had recently. Cool. Uh, edge rankings. Yeah. Okay, we take a peek there. You started out with Jalen Phillips. I think we did this in the middle of last week. Would he pay after that? Yes. Oway Weaver. Uh, and then, oh, I don't have my pronunciation. Odangbo. Oh, Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Chris, out of Vanderbilt. So that's what you had at the edge. Yeah. My Skull Report right. asks, would you be scared to draft Jalen Phillips? Medically retired from college due to concussions, then came back. Yeah. That just terrifies me. Somebody texted me or tweeted me recently and said, he didn't volunteer to, to retire. He was forced to because he hit the, the number of concussions, concussions where UCLA right. said you can't play anymore. Right, right. It's, there, there's no doubt. It's a great question. It's, it's the only thing that scares me about the player. The mm -hmm. only thing. I mean, it really is. Because there's nothing on the field or on film for you to sit there and go, well, I question this or I question that. But that's a big deal. When you're, well, listen, NFL teams for the most part, and you know this, they, they can wipe a lot of injuries, you know, just sweep it under the rug and be like, okay, so what? He hurt his shoulder once. Okay, he tore his ACL. But when you get to neck and head, mm -hmm. that's where you can be put in the old black book where they're just like, well, we don't like to ever draft a guy that has yeah. a neck or a head issue. And we don't do that. So uh, it is scary. It is. Now, I'll say this to that great question from our, from our listener in the fact that um, always with those guys, mm -hmm. I always wonder, I always look at them and go, well, are they going to play differently now? Right. Is it going to affect them throwing their body in a, in, a, in a bad spot or sticking their head in somewhere where, you know, okay, it's dangerous in there. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know what could happen. And that was the other thing that jumped out to me about him. His aggressiveness as a player, it's like he's never been concussed. You know, so that to me is encouraging, but, you know, that is the big question about him. Yeah. It, it's, it's weird. I, I, I really think he's a top 10 player in the draft. There's no doubt for what I see on the film. But that's a big question. Yeah. Where does he end up? You know, and I'll say this too, just to, to pub this. I just did a 30-minute interview with Caleb Farley. The corner from Virginia Tech. Great interview. Please go check on YouTube if you want to see it. It'll be up later this afternoon. He's one of the best interviews I've had out of any of the draftees mm. over the last few years. Just engaged, interactive. Engaged, loves football. You can tell. Not afraid to speak his mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid to tell you I'm awesome. Corner, yeah. what you want out of a corner. Yeah, you want that, yeah. All those things. But there's another guy that I have no problem saying, I mean, if Jeff Akuta is the third pick of the draft last yeah. year, this is the number one pick of the draft. He is a top five player in this draft. Even with the back procedure? But that's their question. That's what I mean. That's where, So I'm, here we go. we got two guys we're talking about where I go, they're top ten in yeah. the draft. But there's legit questions where so you just go, I don't know where they end up. Who are they going to be playing for? I right. don't know. And, and, and how, they, how people respond to those kind of injuries it is a real thing. It is a real thing. I had a coach that used to whisper to me when somebody came back and wasn't the same player. Yeah. Like, he doesn't like it where it's dark anymore. Uh -huh. like, like you mentioned, doesn't, won't hey. just dive in there recklessly anymore. And it's, I got it's understandable. That. I got that. That's what people totally thought about me after I lost the spleen. Yeah. You know, I think there was, I think that was part of, like John Gruden. I think he thought like, oop, that accident was too, that was too big of a car wreck. I don't know if he'll ever be able to stand in there and throw the game. I think there was some of that. Vital organ. Yeah. You mean? I mean, yeah. yeah, listen, I, and I understand the, the, that, you know, question. It's, it's real. It's part of the business. And you just got to kind of take that stuff and try and stride and then hope you get the chance to kind of prove it wrong, right? right. And then that's all you can do. Staying with the edge rushers, we just showed you Quiddy Pay out of Michigan. I think you had him number two, yeah, correct? Right. At Nate Paradise asks, love what you do. Really appreciate the time and dedication. You rank Quiddy Pay highly. I'm wondering how you'd compare him to former Michigan alum Rashawn Gary, who a couple of years ago was the first round pick of Green Bay. Right, right. You know, Gary, Gary was a little bit more of like a hybrid player, defense end, could do some D tackle, all of those type of things. Quiddy Pay, Apaye, I think the biggest thing I will look at or just say right here, he's just got more of a power man element, and he's a twitchier athlete altogether than Rashawn Gary. You know, and I was pretty, I was really high on Rashawn Gary. That's one that I'll, I'll tell you I was a little wrong about. And I also just still don't understand why Green Bay drafted him when they had just signed Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith in free agency. And I want to go, wait, you drafted the same guy? You just paid two guys to play the same position? Does not make sense to me. But um, yeah, I think this is a, a twitchier, more explosive and I have less questions about him translating to the NFL. Okay. I, I just, to me, this guy's floor is really high. Where I just go, his worst is going to be like, he's a starting outside linebacker, defense end type for 10 years. And you're going to be really happy with his play. His best could be, you know, dominant. There's, he's a fun watch. 
It might not be sacks. His name is, it's not production, it's disruption mm. with Quiddy. It is amazing how he dominates blockers and just causes so much havoc in the, back, uh, in the backfield. Uh, I'm a big fan of him. I mean, I would think that's another guy with the limited top-tier pass rushers in the draft. That is, you know, again, top 10, top 12 for Cowboys that, at 10. Would somebody pretty good. That, that certainly could be a, a, yeah. a big one for them, no doubt. Cornerback rankings, you, you just talked about Caleb Farley. Yeah. Uh, people still reacting to your rankings there. Pete, let's take a peek at, at the corners. You had Farley at number one, Campbell from Georgia, two, Sertain from Alabama at three. Yeah. A question here from TJ A. Rove. And T, or, I'm sorry, TG. A Rove, I hope I'm pr uh, pronouncing your last name correctly. Chris docked J.C. Horn for not having explosive top end speed, but he yeah. ran a 4.37. Meanwhile, Tyson Campbell ran between 4.40. Patrick Sertain and Paulson Adebo ran a 4.42. Maybe there's some pro day times in there. Points well taken. I know. Is yeah. this worth reevaluating? No. It, 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 listen, I, I I hear you there, and I pay attention to these things this year. I think 40 times have less weight this year than any time I can ever remember. We just. But for a lot of these cases, we don't really we have we don't who's who's released that time. Oh, it's hearsay. I've talked to a bunch of scouts. At I least talked to the, one scout. At least at the combine, it was all one time that it, you could compare it, it to. It was all one time. You knew it was the same guy at yeah. the end, which was a machine, which right. is a laser who had no bias or didn't, you know, hey, you could have certain guys who time things differently, too. You know, that's so it's hard that way. I This is going to be a year. It's, that's why the draft is interesting. Where right? I mean, it's going to be more than ever is going to be film related. And again, I like J.C. Horn. There's, there is a lot to like about the player. But just, again, what I see on film is, is a guy that's a little more sluggish that way as far as turning and getting to sixth gear or putting his foot in the ground because he's a big guy and, you know, not taking extra steps. Those were, those were the issues I worry about. You know, the bigger receivers in football, I know he's going to be matched up against them. But you're not guaranteed it's always going to be a big receiver. Right. You know, you're, hey, I'm over here at left corner. Well, oh, no, it's Tyree Kill. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Mm. You know, that's where, again, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm a little different that way. It's why I value pure speed and what I see that way. And that's to me where the top two guys and Tyson Campbell and Caleb Farley, they had – Nobody ever athletically overwhelmed them. Not to say they played perfect in every game, but I never came away from a game going, they got scared or they, got, they stopped playing bump because they didn't like this or they knew that guy could run away from them, so he changed how he was kind of playing, all of those type of things. They kind of just, again, their movements and all that, I love that, but that last piece of it was, oh, here's Tyson Campbell and Devontae Smith or Jalen Waddell. Oh, it's, he's still bumping. It's yeah. the 12th play in a row, and he's still bumping. And when they do get a clean, clean release and take up off the sideline, yeah. he's not like, oh, my gosh, i got to catch up. Oh, my God. It's like, oh, no, he caught up. He's right there right. in his hip, and he can still make a play. Who was the Clemson kid last year that you liked AJ because of how Terrell, he did? Yeah, how against he did against LSU. Jamar Chase. Yeah. Right? People were going, well, did you see what Jamar Chase did? And I want to go, isn't Jamar Chase the best receiver in football? <laughs> and wasn't he in his hip pocket? The whole time? It challenged him the whole game. He challenged him. Yeah. yeah, he let up some catches. I know that. Listen, Jamar Chase is awesome. We're talking about him being a top five pick here, top six pick, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I think sometimes people look into that. Again, it goes into the production. Right. Like, oh, he let up the catch. And I just go, no, take it for what it is. You know, he's all over an elite athlete and was never outclassed that way. And I think that's why I like those top two guys a lot. Got to spend a little bit of time with the quarterbacks. Kellen Mond is one that uh, people like to talk to you about. You yeah. You have him rated higher than most. You have him rated where on your quarterback I, list? Number four. Five? Okay. I'm number a huge four. Kellen Mond fan. At Tom Brady is booty. He's back for a second week Whoa. in a row. Tom, Tom Brady is Becoming a friend of the program. Woo! Is Kellen Mond a guy that would benefit from taking a year to learn under a veteran quarterback, maybe someone like Cam Newton? Uh, I mean, that is, the, that is, you know, the place I kind of look at a little bit, you know, to where I go, oh, New England could be a place that's into Kellen Mond, you know, because he's going to be able to run. He's mm -hmm. a really good athlete, but he can really play in the pocket and be a real, like, NFL passer. That's where, to me, he is special that way. And, and, and to answer that question, just to add this, I, I think, I mean, Kellen Mond's ready. I don't think he, he doesn't even need a year. That's where I think I look at him and go, no, I think he's, that's why he's a first-round pick to me. He's got some elite traits about his ability, 
and then he plays the position the right way and was in somewhat of an NFL offense where you see him go through different reads and do that, let alone he was in an offense that he went one, again, one loss with no great talent on his side of the ball mm -hmm. and really played really high-level football just about against everybody they played against and makes so many high-end throws, Paul. That's where I get back to. And I just, that's where I, you know, again, the draft, I just don't understand it some years. Because I could just rattle off quarterbacks that were drafted in the first round. And I want to go, their film does not compare to, I mean, uh, Kellen Mond. Right. It, but, and yet his arm is stronger, and he went 9 and 1 in the all SEC schedule, and he makes great decisions. And he's got – throws perfect spirals, and he's got every club in the bag, and he can really step on the gas and throw lasers. And where I want to just go, why? Why is he not a first-rounder? I know you think he's a first-rounder. I do. But you also know the way the draft works. I and, know. And what other evaluations are out there. Yeah. Do you think he will be available for New England in round two? I, I, I mean, the way it sounds to me, I think, like, Kellen Mond is that guy that could be – Late first round, somebody mm -hmm. trades up, like maybe what Green Bay did to Jordan Love. There's a perfect example. I would go. You think he's better? What? Kellen Mond compared to Jordan Love? It, it's yes. I mean, you know, I kind of liked Jordan Love last year. Yeah. All, but Jordan Love had all these like, oh, it's five great throws, and then you had ten in a row where you just went, that wasn't so great. What's that? Kellen Mond has five great throws, and then it's five more great yeah. throws, right. and then I want to go, why? What, what are we? And he's a better athlete than Jordan Love. Right. And that's what's just weird to me about the drafts. Some least years. That, that was my least favorite pick in the I don't know 15 years I've been diving into it. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, me Jordan too. Love to me the Packers. Too. I still am pissed off about that. But have but, you seen your guy on Jeopardy? By but, the way. Oh, of course I have. I'm, I've he's been doing well. He's doing well. I, he's doing well. That's yeah. right. I, I agree. Um, but yes, to the New England part too. I could see that. You know, Kellen Mond, late first round, early second round type guy. If he's sitting there on the board at maybe yeah. 37, 38 or something like that, I wouldn't be shocked to see New England come up and get him. And if a team gets him in the second as opposed to the first, it just feels like they get more of a pass to sit him. I agree. Agree. Like this person brought up there. So uh, yep. Tom Brady is booty. Nice job. Yeah. Two weeks in a row. Yeah, good um, questions today. 49ers question. And it's, uh, I mean, it's 99% chance they're going to take a quarterback yeah. at three. But just, right. just in case, there's some fun conversations if yeah. they're going elsewhere. Abraham Akiyui. Aka Yui, A K U E I. Pete, where's the. <laughs> Pete says sure. He's saying sure. All right. Abraham, could the 49ers draft Kyle Pitts instead of Mac Jones and let Jimmy Garoppolo and Josh Rosen compete? Pitt and George Kittle would be a pretty special tandem. Oh, that definitely would. I mean, that'd be about the most special tandem in the history of football at tight ends. Uh, you know, and I, again, I haven't done my deep dive on these tight ends yet. I mean, Pitts, I've seen enough to know, like, damn, it's good. I mean, they just, there's just not many people that can move and, and basically play the tight end position and then split out and you go, wait, is that a receiver, a high-end receiver, or is it still a tight end? You don't even know. But... But, but yes, but the thought is, you know, again, he kind of said it in the it's, it's a, it's, they're going quarterback yeah. here. You know, it, all signs have pointed to that towards the offseason. There's obviously something about, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, the 49ers are not bought in on. I mean, they're telling all of us that. They've been telling us that without saying it. So it is going to be quarterback. And, you know, I think in the, the long run, too. As much as I like Kyle Pitts and he's going to be a top 10 pick or whatever else that way, I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, what they need for their team at this point. I mean, how much money and resources are you going to put into that position? You know, they just gave Juszczyk, who's similar to a tight end slash fullback kind of guy, and, of course, Kittle's the highest paid tight end in football. I'd like to see it. I hear you that way, but I don't think it's real realistic. Okay, now we're all set to focus on the defensive tackles. Uh, presented by Applebee's. Prospect rundown here, presented by Applebee's. The 2021 draft defensive tackle rankings, according to Chris Sims. A uh, couple of quick ones here. Yeah. When scouting a defensive tackle, this is from Eberflus1. Do you favor players with great power or more finesse? Yeah, I, I would say at this position, I'm more about the power than anything. You know, um, hey, I, I'd love to see you know, speed and quickness and, and that type of stuff. But it's a position of power. Even, in, even if you're a really good speed guy, right, and you're going to be in that 4-3 system that's going to be like, hey, speed, get through that gap, upfield, you still got to have tremendous power. That, 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 that to me is, of course, the biggest thing here. 
You know, I don't care what defense you're in. If you're playing defensive tackle, too, you know, of course, you're going to have big men in front of you that you're going to have to win one-on-one -on -one battles, but I, you're going to have to take on some double teams at times and stuff. I, there's no way you can avoid that all game long, all the time. So, you know, your power in those issues, uh, your power as far as in those little, um, you know, uh, situations is, is, is very real, let alone, you know, the power to hold your ground, push the pocket in the pass game. You know, that, that to me is the most important thing. And then, and then I go, okay, what kind of athlete is he? Mm -hmm. How disruptive is he? Can he shoot gaps? Can right. he fly and do all that? That's, that's kind of where, where I go with that. Pete, let's run the uh, top five from last year. It's a group. I remember the show we did last year about defensive tackles. Right. You loved this group. I did. Jared Brown was one. Javon Kinlaw, two. Gallimore, three. Raquan Davis out of Alabama, four. And Jordan Elliott from Missouri at five. So, all these guys played a lot, all had over 300 snaps last year. Was anyone a real big difference maker? Uh, Brown was the best, clearly, clearly. Now, you know, Raekwon Davis, he's the guy I look at next to go, watch out for him because he, he you know, again, he's a, he's a space eater. He's a guy that you're not going to have a lot of stats, but he's a guy I look at to Raekwon Davis to go, like, watch out. He could become sort of a household name down there in Miami here over the next year or two, next to Christian Wilkins and all that. Mm. Um, I was wrong about Neville Gallimore as far as he shouldn't have been number three. He probably should have been five, you know, but we'll see. We'll see. But I think the only one that really, really stood out was Derek Brown. And not that that was like a superstar level of stuff, but still there were so many games last year with Carolina where – I just went, damn, who's, who's that guard? Who's pushing that guard back like that, like a cartoon into the quarterbacks? <laughs> oh, that's Derek Brown. Look at him. You know, Derek Brown has a chance to be a real, real special defensive tackle. You can go yes, no with some of these quickies here. Yeah. Brady, Lisa, 39. Do you see anyone in this class being an elite three technique? Aaron Donald, Fletcher Cox, DeForest Buckner. Um, y yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I, yes, you, you'll see. My top guy, I mm -hmm. think, is the elite, t and I don't want to give that out quite we'll yet him, here. Yeah. But, but he, he's the guy where I just go, three technique could be really elite in production, disruption, and all of those things. At Charlie Rossman, any defensive lineman worthy of a D1, of a round one pick? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, out of these defensive tackles, you know, I think there's certainly my top two are. Okay. And then after that, you know, I think the next two on my list are like, I, you know, maybe they could sneak into late in the first round, but I think most likely maybe towards the top half of the, first, the second round. I, it, it's tough. And I don't have a total picture of tight ends, like I said, yet, the middle linebackers. So I don't know my full range of the first round yet. Like <laughs> anybody that's listening, I've, I've had a lot of guys that are, I've had 25 to 45 guys where I've said, they could go between 25 right. and 45, right. <laughs> All right, rankings. We're yeah. going to go again. We're going to go five down to one. Uh, starting out at number five, top defensive tackles at a USC, Jay Tufele, 6'3", 305. Yeah, fun watch. little uh, stout ball of power is what Jay Tufele is. Uh, you know, the first thing, uh, just that. Yeah, the power aspect. It's real. You see it right away. Now, it's not a giant man, right? So he's not going to be like, yeah, I know a 6'3", 305 is giant. It is. But at that position. At that a position, it's not giant. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Unless you have just incredible Aaron Donald quickness or something like that to offset that. But Tufele, um, first off, you know, yeah, stout, athletic. I'm not going to sit here and go crazy athletic, but, you know, fast. Got some twitch to his game. It's good get off, not great get off. You know, but I think the thing I like about him more than anything is, you know, just the combination of, of strength and then athleticism overall. You know, his ability to run sideline to sideline and chase down the football is all really good. And, and the other thing, too, is one-on-one -on -one blocking. And this is a guy here that I think is a 4-3-3 technique who could also do some shade nose stuff a little, too. And I don't think you're going to want to make a living of him that way. But, like, in one-on-one -on -one situations, hey, he, he's tough. And he can get off blocks. And I think the other thing I love about him is, is like his eyes into the backfield. That's the other thing. And that's, that was big to me with a lot of these guys in the top five where you know, they had great awareness of, and this is something you know, I learned up in New England really with scouting, is just that, that ability of like, is this a guy that just busts through the line and then he's like, oh, wait, where's the ball? Mm -hmm. Or is this a guy who has always got his eyes on the ball while busting through the line or taking on a double team or doing that? 
and he had really good ability to do that as well. Listen, he's not like going to just wow you with quicks or wow you with power, but it's all real good. That's where I would say that, you know, and, um, you know, has like a, a, an incredible one arm shrug that he gets off people. Like he'll be on the edge of somebody and he just gets that right arm and can shrug off and get people that way. You know, he is pliable, good, fluid athlete. Um, you know, and, and, and like his negatives, there, there were few and far between. You know, I, some double teams pushed him back. Like I said, that's not going to be like his go to greatest thing he does in the world. But one on one, you're not going to move him. You know, at the worst you're going to get there is a stalemate. And then, you know, the athleticism and just, again, when I say pliable, right, or fluid athlete, I I, I probably need to explain that a little bit more. Because you have some of those deep tackles who are just, you know, they're stiff and I run this way and I'm up here. And they can't get into positions like this if you're not watching on TV where, you know, you're, you're grappling with a lineman and you're in some weird position bent this way, and, oh, I can still throw him off and push him to the ground. Stiff guys can't do that sometimes. Mm. And he's very good that way and can kind of, like, you know, shoot a gap and get sideways, even though he's, you know, a big guy at 305. Yeah. So, again, not a superstar player, but I would be shocked if it's a guy that doesn't have a really good career in the NFL and play for a long time, I kind of compared him to like a Malik Collins, a Larry Okunjobi, uh, who was drafted by the Browns and now just signed with, I think, the Bengals in free agency. Uh, good player, really, real good player. I liked watching him. And he presents this challenge that so many of the, uh, the guys do right now, opted out this past fall. So I you're know. going back to watch uh, from yeah. a while ago, last time he played Which football. Is, yeah. But I do like that he played right away. You know they have crazy talent at USC, exactly especially right. at that position. Freshman All-American, so played and was good right away. Ascended the next year, was first team All-Pac-12, and a lot of people were watching and waiting and just, you know, he, he didn't play this past year. Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 I think, like, those points you bring up speak to the realness of the player. Like, mm-hmm. not physically overwhelmed from the day he wa- worked on, got on campus. Which I think is huge. Yeah. It is, it is, because that tells you that it's a, just a big, natural, strong, yep. athletic guy. Right, he didn't need to like. Oh, he's got to get in the weight room, and we got to coach him, and all that. Like he, he can do it. And you know, yeah, it's that's the tough thing about this because the, again, these are kids we're talking about. Another year of being bigger and stronger, and what would he have looked like this year? You know, that that's that's the interesting thing about this draft altogether. Um, but but yeah, I I like the player, and like I said, not that I look at the ceiling as being like super high, but. I don't, the floor is not low. The floor is high here, too, with this player, and that's why I like Tufeli a lot. At four, we go to the ACC, a little bigger player, Aleem McNeil, 6'2", 320, uh, which obviously will help at that position. Um, what do you like about him having him that high? I mean, immovable, immovable. I, 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 I don't know how many snaps I watch. I never saw him get moved. Never. I mean, you're talking about, like, this guy is – Brandon Williams, Vince Woolfork type of guy. Mm. And there's athleticism to it, too. It's not like he's just going to stand there and hold his ground and, okay, I'm going to eat up double teams and just two-gap and do that. Like, you know, he's capable of winning gaps and pushing the, the, the pocket in the face of the, of the quarterback and doing that stuff. That's where I really loved it. You know, um, he's, he's – I, I wrote he's a more athletic Brandon Williams is what I got to, but – you know, he, he can two-gap. This is a true nose tackle. Okay, this is what I should have said, to, too. Yeah. Sorry. I, it's a true nose tackle, shade nose. He'll never be a three technique. He is going to be a guy that I think is going to – three, four-ish teams are going to love him because he can just stand people up. I mean, there's so many snaps of just like, it's set hut and he's off the ball, and he's like – he's standing in a squat position, and there's a 300-pound lineman, and they're not moving, and he's just watching the ball – Oh, wait, the ball's over here. Oh, no, he's coming back over here. Get off me, blocker. Boom, I'm going to make the tackle. Mm. He was phenomenal that way. He really was. With, like, you know, just for a guy like that to be that big and that stout and that thick like that, I mean, he moves easy. He's got great body control. This is an athlete. You know, he's a linebacker and running back in high school, all-conference baseball player. Actually went to NC State to play baseball and football as a nose tackle. 
That's amazing. I didn't know that. I don't look up that crap. I don't even know. But that's great. I get into. Yeah. Well, that's good. It makes me. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? It makes me feel good about what I watch because I went. The guy looks like a really natural athlete. Yeah. Like this is not just like some big strong guy that was like I don't know what to do with life. I guess I'll play D tackle because I'm big and strong, right? No, I, I mean, uh, I, you know. Here, here, just I'll just get into my notes a little bit. I mean, first off, the, the the low center of gravity, the thick legs. I mean, I just wrote right away. He looks like he's impossible to move. And then I just wrote, I'm really impressed with the movement. He's very quick off the ball. He's got, you know. I have one question that's growing as you're as you're listening to stuff off. Yeah. Why isn't he higher? It, I, because you're going to see the other three guys are, are pretty damn good, too. Okay. And, 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 you know, listen, maybe nose tackle has a little less value than some of the real disruption guys. But, you know, this is why I said these two guys, these next two guys we're about to get into, they're those late first round, maybe early okay. second round type of guys. Um, and, and maybe I'm a guy that loves these guys more than, than, than the normal guy. I, know. I, I right. love these. I just, like I said, I know how important they are to good defenses. I really are. So I, I'm always into this. But, like, you know, the body control, even, like, with things like, again, where, all right, I'm in this, I'm over here in this gap over on the left side between the, the guard and the center. The defensive play callers call the defense where I have to now, you know, slant to the opposite A gap, mm. right? I got to go. Five feet to the right. Tough move for these guys. Right. Why yeah. someone's going to probably be blocking you. And his strength and low center of gravity, it's as good as I've ever seen as far as like, okay, yeah, I'm going over there. And, yeah, you're pushing me in the back. But I'm going to stop when I want to stop. You're not going to keep pushing me and I'm going to, like, fall down three gaps later and do all that stuff. That's where uh, I was really amazed with some of that ability, you know. And um, – yeah, I just think the quick hands, the ability to lock you out and control you, you know, he's going to have, no matter what defensive scheme you're in, people are going to like him. Because they're going to go, wait, he could be a 4-3 shade nose who's going to be able to do some two-gapping for us, but also going to be athletic to get into gaps and create a little disruption. And then the 3-4 people are going to go, oh, I, I definitely like this guy. His ability to hold up centers or guards and just kind of control them is, is really, really special. He's not as massive as Vita Vea was, but it sounds like the same kind of player. It's, it's, Will he provide the same? It, it's, it's that. It, it is. I think he's more even um, – Vita Vea is going to be more like the next guy we're going to talk okay. about. All right? Okay. But this guy has more of – that's why I wrote, like, the, the Brandon Williams-Vince Woolfolk thing, where it's just a little bit more of, like um, – it's not about just overall big athleticism causing disruption. He's a little more of, like I said, the controlled set hut, gets his hands on you, and it's like, uh-oh, he's not moving, and we're not going to be able to move him. We're going to have to run the ball to some other gap because right. he's not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned the next guy. Yeah. You ready for number three? I'm ready for it. Okay. At number three, defensive tackles, Tyler Shelvin out of LSU. You mentioned he's bigger, taller, 6'3", and much bigger, 346 pounds. Yeah. Now, th that, that to me is like Vita Vea. That's yeah. why I said that. Because Vita Vea, I want to say, was around 350, I think, coming out. Or maybe 340-something. Was yeah. it? Was it something around there? 350 sounds about 350, right. 350, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, listen, I – they don't make humans like this very often. They, I mean, in the, the, the greater planet Earth area, okay, there's not too many people walking around looking like this guy. All right? Vita Vea was 347. 347. For okay. So this he's, guy's right, 346. he's right in their ballpark. I mean, the names I wrote down were Vita Vea, Haloti Nada, mm. right? Uh, Eddie Goldman who is arguably the best nose tackle in football for the Bears. You know, didn't play last year. He was an opt-out. Sean Rogers, a guy I played with at Texas, who, you know, had a really good year, uh, career with, with the Detroit Lions and the, and the Cleveland Browns. You know, but, but I mean, it, it's only so often you see a guy this big that can move this way. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, it's, this is a shockingly explosive athlete for 346 pounds. I think that's the first thing. You know, and he's, he's a little different, like, you know, where the NC State guy is a little bit more squattier, roly-poly for me to come up with a better phrase there. This guy's just an enormous human being. This is like, this is a guy that, it doesn't look sloppy or gross or anything like that. He's got an unbelievable pair of legs. 
His ass, we could put four glasses of water on top of it. <laughs> all right? And then it's not like he's got this gigantic belly. He's got a belly because he's a D tackle, but it's all proportional. Yeah. You're not looking at him like just like, ugh, that's a big, gross belly. What's that going to look like in five years? I'm right. a little scared about that. Um, uh, Better pass rusher than McNeil? Yes, he's more disruptive that way because he just got a more ex- – he might not – Yes, he is. He's got more explosion and get off the mm-hmm. ball, you know, and that's where it's it's Vita Vea ish that yeah. way, where he you can go set hut. I want you to split the guard and center and just cause havoc. He can do that. Let alone he can do the other stuff we just talked about with McNeil from NC State too, where he can two gap and do those type of stuff. I don't think he's quite as polished as McNeil at some of that stuff as far as locking people out and controlling them and doing that. But I, I have no doubt that he can do it. You see him do it. He mm-hmm. just doesn't do it as much as McNeil does. But, I, I mean, I just – Some things in his background. Okay. As, you, as you're, you're looking through yep. there, just to understand with the total recruit. Number one recruit in the state of Louisiana over Devontae Smith the year he came out. So this is someone who could so have gone go. anywhere. Right. He's used to being considered, and, you know, the kind of confidence that comes with those kind of traits. Yes. And that kind of physical ability. Has some stuff in his background, his missed games for discipline, uh, academics. He opted out this past year. Right. When you look at just traditional ways of production for a D lineman, doesn't have a lot of that on the stat line. No, definitely not. Any of that bother you at all as you take it into consideration? Yeah, it it, it always bothers. That that type of stuff bothers me. It does. You know, it's 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 the hardest thing about you know my job is just because I can't always get all the right inside info. Sure. And I wish I could meet. You're these evaluating guys. what you see on film that's, more than anything. That's what I'm trying to go by. Yeah. But you know the things you're talking about there. You know, the, I've heard a lot of those stories with defensive tackles over the year. Right. It's kind of the it's part kind of, of part of the deal. Sometimes. It is. It's part of the yeah. beast with that guy right there. Yeah. You know, like I said, he's he's a mean bull. Yeah. And they can be a little crazy at times. And, yeah. And you know, kick and, and, and right. be uncomfortable. And I, I don't know the extent of some of those things that right. kept them off the field. They, they could be immature sort of things. Sure. They exactly. could be more major concerns, and I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know which, which side it comes down. I on. know. I know. It, that, that's the. It, it is the tough thing. And, you know, that's, that's where... Do you worry about weight control? <sighs> Always with those guys. Oh, like with a guy this big, yes. You know, that, that's, again, where it goes into, like... And, again, I don't have the answers to these things, but that's where, like, to everything you're saying, you know, you're going to have to rely on your guy that scouts that team who is there, mm-hmm. you know, a handful of times every year. He's got a little connection with the weight coach and all those things that go like, wait, does this guy have an eating problem? Are we going to yeah. be like every week, I hope he can make weight this week, yeah. you know, and, and that type of stuff. Pete, just, Pete did, did you say the number 375? Reports he was up to 375 in the fall. Yeah, that's, that's, that's scary. It yeah. is. It is. Now, you know, again, for guys like that to put on 15 or 20 pounds, it's, it doesn't take much for them to do that. Right. Yeah, that's the other thing we all got to realize. This is a different human. You know, he can have a bad week of eating and put on 10 pounds, no problem. So you put two or three weeks of uh, I'm not playing football and I'm going to take a little time to rest, I bet you he could get to that. So those are the things you have to do homework on. You know, is this a guy that's going to work, going to stay on top of that? And not that it has to be perfect. Hey, I, I played on a lot of teams – you know, even when I was working in New England, mm-hmm. Friday morning, I, I promise you the first person in the building was going to be Vince Wolfort because he had a weigh-in. He had to stay at a weight. He was going to be in there. How much was he supposed to Pro- be? I can't remember what his number was. Yeah. I, I don't know. But he was going to be in the sauna for a few minutes yeah. and just make sure he made the right weight. So, it, it, again, even, and Vince Wolfork is the ultimate professional for defensive tackles. So that, just just a little look into, like, these guys are big, and weight is a thing for them. Mm-hmm. And we want them to be big to hold them double teams and do that, but yet then we're like, well, don't be too big because then you can't move. It's a fine line. But, man, legit quicks off the ball, uh, really good get off. I mean, and can win with explosion shooting gaps, let alone the strength and power. It's just, again, on film, it's just what is there not to like? Right. Right. It's just going to be I really it's going to be about the things you ask. That'll be the ultimate deciding factor probably about where the guy goes. And you know people are doing their homework on that kind of thing and figuring out something that they can be comfortable with and accept like you said sometimes in that position that's you guess, part of the sometimes deal, you part deal of the with personality that. that's or, right. or if it's uh, on the other side of right. it. Right. Did, did, did you ever walk in on any any of the linemen in the rubber suits 
jump and rope in the shower turned up to like 400 or whatever? Oh, uh, uh, definitely. Doing anything they could to lose weight. Or, or, or they would be in the, the sauna with the yeah. rubber the rubber yeah. thing on, and you're like, Are and you- with and th- th- this was the 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 max of it for me with a big pinch of Copenhagen to make him sweat even oh, more. No doubt. Well, to, defensive to tackles even- love Copenhagen. <laughs> they love dip. Defensive linemen are definitely the dipping the dipping kings of the uh, NFL football team. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of a lot of those. I was trying to think. I mean, um, I mean, I've, I, just about every team I've had. I mean, there was always you know, there's always two or three guys in every NFL team, maybe three or four guys that. Yeah, weigh in every week was a yeah. thing, and it's 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 you know Thursday, Friday they were like, oh crap, I got to weigh in tomorrow. <laughs> Where are we going to dinner tonight? Yeah, right? I know I'm not going to meet you guys tonight. I, I got to go home and eat a salad. <laughs> go home All right, see you later. Eat like a rabbit. Yeah. Okay. Up to number two. Yeah. To the SEC, staying in the SEC from LSU yeah. to Alabama, Christian Barmore, six five three ten. I got to say, a, a lot of people, whether it's right or wrong, have him at one. Yeah, I know. You have him at two. I do. I mean, I I, I like him a lot. I do. You know, um, I guess I guess my, you know, well, let's just the, the big thing is, listen, he's he's big guy. He's high cut waist, you know, which, which is you don't always see that with defensive tackles. You know, legs are good. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm like blown away. He's with not going to make look. your leg an ass team. He's not going to make that team. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to I'm not blown away by his look. Right. Um, but. I mean, again, this is a really high-level player. He, he runs well for 310 pounds. You know, I wasn't blown away with the twitch and the power, right? I, I don't think I was blown away by it. I mean, I don't think this is a guy that I would sit here and go, I, you know, Barrymore's good. I don't think he's as twitchy as, as uh, our, our big guy we just talked about, Shelvin. Mm. Uh, I don't. I don't not, as a, just a pure off-the-ball Quick athlete. No, I don't think he's as athletic as Tyler Shelvin, who's got a 36 pound advantage on him. Are they in the same category in terms of like if you're considering a D tackle, is this the same branded D tackle? I mean, you have one who's 346 and one who's 310. Right. This guy's got, I think, a little bit more versatility to where he could play. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where I think Barrymore, and that's why he's number two and not number three. It was because I think this guy could be a five technique. And a th- real three, four, just line him up, head up over the great tackles in football, and he'll be fine. And did kind of move around the line there at Alabama. He did exactly yeah. right. So you get to see all that, and I think that's part. That's part of his value. I, he can play three technique. He can play shade nose. He, so he can do all those things. There's a little more versatility in what he can bring to your team as com- compared to the last, you know, two guys we talked about. You know, he is. He killed it in the college playoff I was games. Ask you about that. He yeah. killed it. Both of them. Yeah. The rest of the year was not quite like that. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's a little bit weird and a weird of an evaluation. You know, you know he can play a little high. He is a little bit of a stiff as an athlete overall. But man, his two gap ability is is special. And you know, getting back to the eyes in the backfield and those type of things. You know, he was special that way too. He always knew where the ball was. He was never stressed out. Wait, I got okay. Wait, hold on. I got to hold this guy. Ball's over here. Ball's over there. Oh, wait, the quarterback's scrambling. Okay, now I can go get him. Do that. I mean, he was all on that, and that's huge for that position. But there's not a ton of like disruption and wow with his game. And I understand that's not always going to be the case with Bama guys. It's not going to be the case because they do ask the two gap and stuff. But you look for that more than you look for the stats. I do. So, I mean, it, it, it does matter quite a bit it, for it, you. It, it does matter for me. Yeah. It does. Where I guess I'm trying to say is like, okay, let's say a few years ago, Deron Payne came out of there. Yep. It wasn't, again, a ton of disruption and stuff like that. But there was just more physical domination, uh, I felt, in the game. And more of an immovable force, maybe. Which, which, which yeah, I, I, I like that. But I guess that's, you know, part of the reason why I have him too and not number one. You know, I just did, doesn't make as many plays as you would think. You know, I'm not saying it was bad, but we're talking about like what everybody is talking about is the slam dunk number one interior D lineman in the draft. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was expecting more from that. Now, the other positives are there's no negatives. I mean, he never gets pushed back, never. So that's, that's always a positive with me. And he does, like I said, take, do a great job two gapping or taking on double teams. But I didn't think he was like this overall fluid athlete. I guess what I'm saying is 
yeah, he's real good. I worry about how it'll just translate every week in the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know, again, when I talk about some of those fluid athlete movements, about just, you know, uh, changing direction, that being easy, being in an athletic position, he could be high and a little bit like, wait, oh, I got to turn that way and then go. And, you know, being in those awkward positions of where you're in a stalemate or fighting at the line of scrimmage, you know, I didn't think his strength was maybe as great as some of the other guys when right. he's in those awkward positions to throw people off him and do that. And when, you, when you're talking about someone who is potentially number one at their position, you have him too, a likely first-round pick or real good chance to go in the first round. We get to this point where it's easy to be uh, overly skeptical and you kind of look for things. I remember calling that game, calling the Notre Dame-Alabama game, and my eyes went to a couple other people on the front seven in terms of, whoa, more than him. Doesn't right. mean he's not a really good player, right. but he wasn't the first or second that you were like, man, oh man, that's that's incredible. That's the guy there. And that, yeah. that says more about Alabama's front seven sure. than it does about the player. Right. But does that sort of thing matter at all? Well, it does. It does. There's the, the, the eye test, the wow factor. Yeah. Like that. I don't think he just necessarily kills it in that department. I think that's what you're saying. He's a, he's a guy where you probably in pregame are like, yeah, he looks good or whatever, but you didn't like walk away in pregame on the field and go, Man, did you right. see 58? Yeah. Holy crap. Like, he's not one of those guys. I think you would have said it with the other two guys, mm-hmm. you know, Shelvin or McNeil. And I think the first guy we're going to talk about here in a second, you would have had a lot of snaps where you would have gone, yeah. whoa, who was that crazy guy in the middle yeah. that got off the ball that way? So, yeah, there, there is something to that. And, um, you know, what, he, he, he can win. And he's got athleticism. I'm not, again, we're being picky and we're talking about the top few guys in the draft here a little bit. And I feel like I'm making this sound negative on Barrymore and I don't want it. You know, he can, he can shoot a gap and do some of that stuff. He wins with side to side quickness more than anything. You know, he's not going to be like, again, just dominate you, throw you out of the way, get in the backfield, and I'm going to do that. I guess that's where I worried about it, too. You know, he, when he did win, it was just shaking a guy and then getting on the edge and going by him with his speed that way. I have a hard time thinking he's going to be able to win like that consistently in the NFL, too. I guess that's why I make him second. Yeah, um, first-round pick? He's definitely a first-round pick. There, 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 there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, I just want to make sure. I mean, hands are good. He's got a good swing move. I talked about the side-to-side quicks, you know. Um, I just wrote real good player, not wowing in any way, really high floor, three technique, five technique, could even play some crash end on the strong side of a 4-3 defensive end that way. Uh, But the best thing he does is two gaps and sheds blockers and eyes in the backfield. I I wrote somewhere between 20 and 32. I'm obviously a little low on the guy as compared to everybody else. So we'll see where this goes. And again, there's not a lot of great D tackles yeah. in the draft, so maybe that ha- tends them to bump them up farther. I think even those who have him at number one think that 20 to 32 might be the range just because this class of D tackles isn't yeah. seen as, as that strong. Right. Okay, uh, that's good to hear. Up to number one. Yep. Pac-12, Washington. I'm going to make sure I get this one right. I'm on double secret probation. Good luck. You go after first. After how I butchered someone there early in the show. Um, so former Husky Levi Onzerike is your number one player at defensive tackle. I'm here for this because he's the lightest one of your top five, and I know how much you value physical traits of this position. I so know. At 6'3", 293, how is this your top guy? I didn't expect it. I didn't. But first off, I think the first thing uh, I jump out at me more than anything, I mean, he's got the strength of a 330-pound guy. That's where I just kept going. They play him a nose tackle wow. a lot, where he just gets over the, the center and – you look at him and you just go, well, he can't really do this consistently, can he? Okay, every play, he just dominates. And it just holds guys up, just like we talked about with the other one. Just can, he's got an incredibly quick get-off and gets his hands on you so quickly that a lot of these offensive linemen are flustered before they can even kind of get in their set or anything. So he's really explosive that way. He's rare in the fact that at 290, he is a phenomenal athlete. He moves like he's a guy like 275 pounds, but yet has the strength of a, a 330-pound human being. That's where I just was, you know, totally taken away by the guy. It's just a great blend of thick and athletic-looking type of guy. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote down Jonathan Allen. Mm. 
You know, who, what was Jonathan Allen a few years ago? Top 10, top 12 pick for the Washington he, football team? I think he was, he was top half of the he first might have been, round. I mean, he had to, I want to say he was top 10 for sure. I want to say he might have been five or six. 17. So 17, okay. Top half, yeah. All right, so, so 6'3", 300, 300 pounds. He, can, he was, or was, he came out on the combine that heavy? I thought he was even a little lower than that. But At 293, would you take him and think that you had to add weight? Or is, is he okay where he is? No, I, I just think that he'll be a... a to me, he looks like he's got a he's got a little weight room in him, but not like weight room into where I go, oh, this is really a 270 pound man that's worked really hard to be 290 something. Mm. And it's not real. Yeah, I worry about those guys. So I, I think he'd just naturally become a bigger, stronger man. I, I I do. I don't. But man, I mean, Paul, he's a really fun watch. It's just as far as. Like I said, the first step, the get off, it's as good as some of the elite pass rushers in the draft. You know, he's so explosive with the pop in his hands. You know, he's got great contact control with the offensive linemen. You know, really impressive side to side. Can two gap almost as good as Barrymore. It's not as good, but he can he can really do it. And they asked him to do it a lot. And it's just his upper body strength to me was like wowing. Mm. It was wowing with the way he could disengage and throw people to the side and just go chase the ball down. Mm -hmm. That's where I really found it fun to watch. And like, you know, not only just versus the run, versus the pass too. That's huge. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, it, his ability to disengage and all that, I think is what separated him. And there's the disruption, there's the production, everything you want. Um, you know, and one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, good luck. Good luck. And then the other thing I always go into, and you know, you ask me about it too, is just, yeah, he's 290, but I just, I wrote his anchor versus double yeah, team. Doesn't scare you. It, 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 it was really high level where I just went, man, how is he always holding his ground against mm -hmm. some of these offensive linemen? And there's some good offensive linemen he played against there in yeah. the Pac 12. I think it's a good example that people can play strong and play fast that aren't necessarily the strongest or biggest. Just like a guy can look like a 4 3 guy, but he's only a 4 5 guy. There's some real, I mean, there's something to that, that sometimes you just forget about what the paper says about the weights or the speed because you got to trust how they look on the film. Yeah. I, and if he looks like he's three plus and if he plays that way, who really cares that he's 293 instead of 313? Well, and it's, it's like, I, he was one of those where you had to look and I was like, wait, is he, what, what, how much does he weigh? Because he, he kind of almost looks like it's like a 280, a 278 kind of mm. guy, like that kind of guy. You know, so when I saw 290 or 293, I think is what I originally saw and wrote down here, I just went, whoa, okay, he's a little bigger than I, I'm thinking here, looking at him. And then, of course, you know, you look at the arm length and all of that, and then you go, holy cow. You know, I think one of the first plays I saw, he ran like a running back down to the sideline. I went, S speed is the real deal. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just, I was shocked by that, you know, but has bend as a pass rusher. I mean, Ben to the point where I go, if you want to play him a defense end, yeah. he's going to be a handful, like doing stuff like that as well. You know, and eyes in the backfield, again, always knew where the ball was, was all over it. So, yeah, as you could tell, I am a big fan of him. Uh, I said, reminds me of Jonathan Allen. He will be awesome 4 3 3 technique. Okay, if so he that's... has one gap to win, he will win it. Awesome. Yeah. Good description there. The guy before, Christian Barrymore, you said you know, 20 to 32, somewhere in the first. Yeah. I don't think you like him enough to put him in the top 10. So if, if we could go 10 to 20-ish, yeah. you don't have to make one prediction on where sure. he goes. But let's pick a couple of teams. I know you're looking at who I am, picks I'm 10 to 20. I am right now, right. A couple right. of teams in that range that you would be like, yeah, that's, that's a good home for him. Well, you know, I think the Eagles probably got to start thinking about, you know, that at position at 12. Okay. You know, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would think there's some thought there. You know, I'm thinking about the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. You know, they I have a couple a, questions about that on Twitter. About, they, about they, that. They, they got positional need there, and I think he fits that scheme as far as Zimmer and what they want to play. So <laughs> that makes sense to me as far as that's concerned. I'm you looking know, for this Viking question. The go, Raiders go at 17, you know, a Raiders at 17 need everything on the front seven. They need everything. Yeah. I mean, they. You know, so they, they could go whoever's the best available pass rusher or D tackle. Or just anybody in the front seven. Oh, like, if, if they had take right. best front seven player available, you, you, think you could fits? be like, cool. Could be. Okay. That, that's cool. But the, those are the teams I think that jump out to me there. Of course, we know Washington football team, 
You know, no, they're not going to do it. So, yeah, I think those are the teams right there that, that really pop to me. At Vikes 9090, here it is. Love the pod. Been trying to get on for a while, so hey, you made it. I what guess, up? I guess Chris really does hate my and Florio's Vikings. <laughs> what do you think about the Vikings I going? just hate Florio, <laughs> not you. you. <laughs> what do you think about the Vikes maybe going two nose tackles this year with Dalvin Tomlinson and Michael Pierce? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't – it's not a horrible – I mean, it's, there's not going to be much disruption there, yeah. okay? I think that's the big thing. Um, and I'm just pulling up their, their roster all together. But, you know, I think the next, you know, the next thing I, I think with the, like that, they, you know, those are two big-time space eaters. I don't think you're going to have them on the field together all the time. Um, I mean, you're playing a running team that you're scared of that. Hey, sh- certainly could be in that. But if they're looking for that defense end slash defense tackle – hybrid Michael Bennett, Jonathan Allen type guy, because that's Michael Bennett, who's one of my favorite players mm-hmm. ever. He's another one of the names I wrote down for this guy. And I think Bennett came out at like 270-something, and he probably played about 280. But I, I, I could see that being a fit there. I, yeah. I remember watching I do him. like the two big guys inside. That, yeah. That's interesting. I, I didn't really think about move. that, honestly. It would be. I remember watching Bennett in the Super Bowl in Phoenix uh, from field level. Yeah, 49. And just thinking, oh, my God. Gosh, how does this happen? He is the inventor this guy? of the play up. Yeah. That's where I started talking about on the podcast. Yeah. I was going like, this is maybe the best defensive player in football. Yeah. He is unblockable. Yeah. And he gets three sacks a year, and people don't think he's good. And I want to go, no, no. And that, that's really what started it. And then Aaron Donald came into the league. Yeah. And then it was Changed like, well, it is the king of the up the play. Right. So there's the top five. There it is. Go ahead and take a take a look there at one through five. And this is a group that you know, we kind of widely viewed as not as good as last year's group. However, I'm encouraged. I think you should you. be. It's Some a different it's a different type of group. Yeah. It, you know, the, the two, three, and four are not gonna be, you know, major like, oh my gosh, always shooting in the backfield and you see they're not that way. Yeah, they're a little bit more of a space eater. Yep. They can do some of that stuff. So it's not as maybe as sexy as a group as we've seen in years past. But the guy at the top. I'm going to actually read you know, them. He's, he's the one I really like just with the great athletes, stronger than the size. And, you know, the last thing I wrote is, there is he's definitely better than Barrymore for me. Okay. Yeah. So at number one, Levi owns Zurique in case you – are listening and can't see it out of Washington. Number two, Christian Barrymore, Alabama. Three, Tyler Shelvin, LSU. Four, Aleem McNeil, NC State. And at number five out of USC, Jay Tufele. Yeah. Those are the guys. Yep, good guys. And, you know, it, that to me is going to be one of the interesting things of the draft is, you know, again, I don't know if there's a lot of high-level D tackles. And what's that going to do? Is that going to bump these guys up? You know, a few picks or whatever because it's, they're at a premium. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some other guys down the line who have some things you like. Yeah. Where you go, oh, I like that about this player, but oh, I don't like that about the player. These guys at least had the whole package. I never walked away from any of those five going, well, I really have a big question about this. That, right. that didn't come about, and I think that's what separates them. And I want to mention that was the prospect rundown presented by Applebee's. Way to go, Applebee's. Yeah. Good to have him with us. Good to have him with us. All right. Odds of being the first defensive lineman drafted provided by Ooh. Points Bet Sportsbook. We see Quiddy Pay. So what we are including, or they are including, defensive ends and D tackles here. Yeah. Quiddy Pay out of Michigan shows up one, number one. Jalen Phillips, your top rated D end at number two. Yeah, I, I, I think if you made me bet money, I would bet on Quiddy too. Yeah. Because he doesn't have that concussion injury history that we talked about, right? So I, I do think that could hurt Jalen Phillips. You know, of course, listen, I love those top three. That's my top three. Mm-hmm. Not exactly in that order. One and two are switched. But right. uh, I, I would imagine it's one of those three guys for sure. It, it, they are the elite edge guys in the draft. Elite. Yeah. I mean – there's, there's nobody that can compare to them. That, they, to me, it was where I go, I just would think they're, all three are going to go in the top 20 because there's such a difference between them and then the rest of the group. Any chance that your number one D tackle we just talked about, Levi Onzerike, goes before the DNs? Ooh. Before Quiddy Pay or Probably Phillips? not. No, yeah. I don't. I don't. Um, just trying to look at like any of those teams in the the top ten or anything there that way, you know. Uh, 
Hey, the, the Cowboys at 10 could be looking at a pass. They could they could do anything, really. The Cowboys could do D-tackle, D-end, corner. I don't know where that goes. But, no, ultimately, I really think, yeah, the pass rushers, at least two of them will be off the board before we hear, you know, uh, what's say his name again one more time for me? Quiddy Pay? No, the o- owner. O- owner. There we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up to it. Levi Onzerike. Onzerike. Yeah. I'm going to get that straight so I don't butcher it on TV. Onzerike. i got to add that Z in there. Get him on uh, for sorry. an interview. I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. I mean, if his personality is like his play on the field, right. he's going to be fun to talk to. All right. Most important defensive tackle question. I can't believe I've waited this long to ask it, but it comes from Emma Perez 09. What up? Who has the most impressive set of legs and ass in this group? Ooh, well. That's a smiley bumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because this one's an easy one. Yeah, it's my man Tyler Shelvin. He's the one that I, I think you said you could set four glasses. Four glasses of water, of water yeah. on his ass. It's yeah. unbelievable. And I mean, the legs are like, it's just it's just big and powerful. And there's you know, I, it's not just like it's like fat and you look like oh if I cut that open some gravy might come out or something <laughs> like that. It's like there's some muscle and Ooh. definition in there. Let alone, I mean. Pete's Listen, offended at that one. This yeah. is this yeah. is this his ass is an all-time <laughs> ass. You might hear me talk about his ass a lot next year when, yeah. I, when I watch it on the NFL field. Yeah, there should yeah. be an asterisk ne- next to all these ass <laughs> questions because you, you you don't really know where it might go. No, here. no, I know it's a very dangerous question to be asking a person like me. It is okay. Are you easy? Says is there a de- I am. <laughs> is there a defensive tackle? In this draft, that's a pure run stuffer versus one that can be a hybrid and impact uh, in the passing game. Yeah, I think I think it's the two big guys we talked about, McNeil and Shelvin. Those are the real run stop uh, stoppers. You know, I'm trying to think of like I was trying to think of like a. Uh, who was the really big D tackle for like the Ravens back? The day? I'm missing a few D tackles where I wanted to, con- the, to give a comparison to Chris Tyler Canny. Shelvin. Canny is Who a little like that gigantic Massive. guy, gigantic. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm missing somebody Great else. Dude too. But either way, though, that's what these two guys are. Their life is going to be. Can, your job this week is not to be moved, no matter how many people block you. <laughs> right. And McNeil and Shelvin are going to be really good at that. One more of these finishing up kind yeah. of random defensive tackles questions from Coach Amarim. He says, who is the best nose tackle that Chris has ever evaluated? So I'll stop there. Ooh. Best nose tackle you've evaluated? Hold on. i got to pull up teams with that. That's a good question, Coach. That's a really good question. And also, he also wants to know who's the best. Uh, or are there any good nose tackles in this year's draft? You described one of these guys. Yeah, those tackle. two guys. It's those two guys again. Yeah. They're nose tackles. You know, they can. So if they play for a true three-four team, head up on the center every play, McNeil and Shelvin can do that. That's what they were put on earth to do. Mm. So that that is yes, what they'll be. But like I said, they're athletic enough to where four-three teams are going to go. Hey, we, we we have no problem with shading you to the side, right. and you just have to like own that gap. Um, they, those two are those guys. I don't mean to be repetitive here. And uh, I'm trying to think of the best nose tackle since I've really been in this business. I can tell you right off the bat, you know, playing in my day, uh, I mean, of course, I got to see Warren Sapp and mm-hmm. in, in practice and stuff like that. That was scary. Hmm. I went to college with two unbelievable ones in Casey Hampton and oh, Sean yeah. Rogers. Yeah. I mean, Sean, Casey Hampton was a top 20 pick. Sean Rogers was also a top 20 pick, but had a hairline fracture in his shin, mm. his fibula, that made him fall in the second round. Yeah. But the, 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 these are different animals. Chris Jenkins, do you remember him? Oh, yeah. Carolina Panthers. Yes. I mean, these, these humans – Haloti Nada, yes, thank you, Pete. I played against him. He intercepted a pass from me. Um, Haloti did? Haloti. How? You tipped? He, he, he just, yes. He just ran over my garden as I was throwing. He tipped it and, and just caught it. it and ran. Did you tackle him? No, I did not. I, did I you got try? Put, I did. I was down there in the mix. Um, but, like, those kind of guys, just to, like, I mean, I think you and I have discussed this before. I mean, when that guy – and you're underneath the center, and now everybody, if you're not watching, you wish you were because I'm underneath the center. And you're sitting there like this, and there's a guy like Haloti Nada that's right there, and you're going, again, blue 85, blue 85, and you're really going, man, is my center really going to be able to snap me the ball and block that guy at the same time? Yeah. I mean, I used to think that all the time. Yeah. I'm going to be like, Are you, is he really going to be able to do this? Yeah. Is it, how can he stop this guy? And, and snap me the ball, too. I don't think yeah. he can. I mean, I used to be amazed with centers to be able to do that. So, 
Uh, that's what kind of humans they are. But hold on, let me just look to we see. We played Ohio State when they had Big Daddy Wilkinson. Oh. Who was the first, I think he was the first overall pick. He was. Yeah, and I had the same thought. I'm like, e are you sure are you, you can really do that? Gonna, yeah. You know, are you sure? Want some help? I know, you know, and, and like <laughs> Sean Rogers and Casey Hampton used to ruin our practices at Texas. I'm they sure. used to ruin them. Yeah. To where at times you just you they'd have to tell them like dial it back a little bit. Um, but I still haven't answered this guy's question, and I just want to get to that because I'm looking at. I think the guy I would go to, yep. just since I've been in this business, it just kind of hit me here right off the bat, is Deron Payne, who we brought up. Mm. Deron Payne is a beast on the inside, two gapper. You know, well, you know, again, has enough athleticism to play that one gap thing, but just an immovable force. Since I've been in it and really evaluating Bleacher Report slash NBC, I think it's him and probably Vita Vea. Okay. I think Vita Vea. And Vita Vea is a little bit more of a rare D tackle uh, because of his athleticism at that size. And we have three guys who missed the cut. If you want to yeah, hit on any of these well. three quickly, sure. uh, the first one out of UCLA, Osa Odigizua. I, uh, okay. I mean, there's stuff to like here. He scares me just from this standpoint of like, I don't know what position he's going to play. Mm. That's where it scares me a little bit. He's a little bit of the guy where I go, he's a rocked up, really strong, I think he's 280 or 279 where I want to go, it, this is like a 255-pound guy who's gotten the weight room and gotten mm. this big. That scares me a little bit. You know, I don't know what he is. He's just not quite powerful and strong enough of a man for me to go, oh, he's definitely a defensive tackle, and yet he's not quite explosive and fast enough to, for me to go, oh, he's definitely going to be a defense end in the NFL. Mm. I don't know where he is. No, I think ultimately he's going to be an NFL crash end. Okay. I think that's where he is. But there's just there's some stiffness on the ground a little bit too much. And, uh, you know, the other reasons I said there I think are, are just my concerns there. I think he's still going to be probably end of the second round, third round type of guy there, though. i got to hit you up on my Hawkeye. Oh, I knew Iowa. you would. I knew Davion you would. Nixon, what do you see there? Well, you know what? I, I mean, I turned on the film with him and got really excited. Like right away. He's on a lot of top five lists. Because because he's a top five athlete for the position. He's a top five athlete. The way he moves, you know, can run. He's bendable, pliable, changing directions, all of that. You know, that is where I was really like, whoa, I, I like this guy a lot. You know, but the thing I came to more than anything is just I have major power questions about the guy. Major. You know, there's just there's double teams weren't good. Didn't dominate one on one the way he should at 305 mm -hmm. and as athletic as he is that way. So I think that's what scared me more than anything. You know, just the 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 lack of hands and upper body power as I went on. I just went, man, he can't he can't get off blocks. Like, come on, why are you let this guy? He's still pushing you four yards down the field. What? You're too athletic to be letting that happen in that so it was underwhelming that way and I wrote down too like there's no way he can two gap you know so I guess the physicality and the power part of that player is what scared me a little bit okay ready for a right hand turn was there one more guy yet or is that it that oh it? I, I skipped over one guy I'm sorry Mil Milton Williams LaTeX no and it's, it's sorry I, I just I'm sorry about that you're good you're good I just I knew you said three yeah I, Milton Williams is a is an interesting player He's, um, he's a little bit of a tweener, but has unbelievable, and I'm trying to get to the damn page here. Is he, he, he's toward the end, 6'4", he, 278. He's, he's, he's a guy that's he's a tweener. I have no doubt that he's going to be – he's probably the next guy I would have put on the list. I would have probably made him six mm. if we had to rank them right that way. You know, you know, like really good upper body strength. You know, I just – again, La Tech – yeah, he played a lot of lesser competition. I'm not sure he could play D-tackle, play after play in the NFL. I think that's what really bothers me a little bit about the guy. But, man, is he really strong for 278. You know, he really is. Um, I think ultimately, though, this is another guy, like, like I said with, like, uh, Odigizua in that, where it, can he play D-tackle or is he a defensive end? I'm not sure. I liked him better than Odigizua or Taylor from mm -hmm. Iowa and any of that. Because he has some legit edge rush pass, you know, pass rush ability too. Um, you know, plays hard. Uh, I, I, I wrote questionable whether he could play three technique in the NFL 
and all of that. He's a Malik Jackson type defense end. Like, listen, here's what this is the guy where I'm going to go. He might be three years from now a guy where we go, man, this is one of the better interior D linemen in football. He might be. He's a tough eval because of the competition, because mm-hmm. of the size of the guy, all of those things. And in the NFL, they find ways to use guys like this a little bit more. So what I'm basically saying is I like the guy a lot. i just not totally 100% sure as much as I am about the other right. five guys, right? right? Yeah. After about a two- or three-week absence, Chris, quarterback Jeopardy is back. We're back, is baby. back to finish up. Woo! Baby, right. woo, baby. Very little quarterback talk at the top here, so we, we, we got to find a way to work it in How at the end. How dare we? Oh, no, we didn't talk about the quarterbacks today. What are we going to do? The theme here is quarterbacks drafted top ten. It appears four, five. I mean, going to be a bunch of guys. It, 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 could, be, it could be five could in the be top five. ten. Going to be four, could be five. I'm going to call it three right now. You're saying three? I'm saying three. You're saying I feel no, like the tide's turning. No fields, no Lance. Well, Carolina's not taking a quarterback. True. That's done. Right. Detroit could. Detroit could. Denver could. But with what they're tied up with golf right now and all yeah. that, I just would be surprised if they did that right now. Yeah. I would be surprised. Denver is the other one you look at. Mm-hmm. But, again, I don't know, like, what good that does Vic Fangio and group where he's going to go, wait, I'm, I could, my ass yeah. could be on the hot seat here right. this year. We're going to draft a quarterback? I'm going to do that? No, thanks. You know, so that's where Atlanta at four is really a big one. Yeah. And where Atlanta at four, I just want to go, if you're going to take a quarterback at four, then, like, he needs to play this year. I mean, right. and Matt Ryan's still got good game in him. I just I don't see it. I'm going to say three go. Okay. And you're going to see the we'll other see. two, I don't know where the hell it ends up. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about the number six. For 100 points, quarterback has gone with the sixth overall pick each of the last two years. Ooh. Quarterback at six each of the last right. two. Right, so Herbert last year. There you go. And then the year before. And they just named – who was the first – oh, the year before. Okay, the year before was, the top pick. Oh, won. that's Daniel Jones that year. But yeah. that was Kyler Easy. Murray. Yeah. Easy. Sometimes I just need to think about who the top guy was, and then I could think of the rest of the list. Not even sweat and going Not one for one. Not even a sweat. 200. The year Andrew Luck and RG3 went one and two. The next quarterback picked was at number eight. Who and to what team? Oh, my gosh. This kills me, this crap. I want to say it was 2012. It is 2012. Yep. Hold on a second. Damn it, I'm going to mess this up. No, you're not. Sure. No, you're not. I'm not? Number eight. He went number eight. Uh, he's on his second team. Playing well. That's Ryan Tannehill. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that yeah. clue. I yeah. would have got there. Yeah. I think clue I would have got there. I think you would have too. It just, just I, we're, we're doing it. a pod here, and I don't want to yeah. sit here and have everybody listen no. to me go, well. Uh, you had that. You knew it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's hard. I'm getting to the point now where it's like, I want to ask you guys to go, can you just read me off the whole class? But I know that's <laughs> cheating because I we can't can remember do that. who the hell's in the classes anymore. We, we, we are not against a hint. At all, all right. Okay. All right. So for 300, we are going way back. 2002. Year before the Bucks drafted you. Yes. Quarterbacks went one and three. Who were the quarterbacks in 02 and where'd they go? Okay. So 02. Because so I you're almost came. You're an upperclassman came. there at Texas. Yeah. I know you watched that draft. I almost came out. I mean, I was thinking about coming out as a junior. Okay. So De- David Carr went yes. one. Yep. Neither one of these guys worked. No. And I, I know they didn't, but I'm not thinking of number three right now. You nailed one. So, yeah, Carter Houston. Carter Houston. I remember Chris Palmer being in a lot of my practices that year. Mm. Um, I had a really good year, and then I shit the bet against Colorado on the Big 12 championship, <laughs> and that was the end of that. Um, <laughs> hold on a second here. You know this one, too. Number three. I mean, one of the – and I've never Drafted met the person. Drafted by the Bengals? No, 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 it's no, not no. him. No, no. Never met this person, but I mean, when, when, when you go back oh, the last I 20 years. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I played against the guy my sophomore year in the bowl game. Okay. Joey Harrington. Yes, to Detroit. Yeah. Joey Harrington. Yeah, just, Damn. just didn't happen in I the was league. so, yeah. I mean, oh, I'm so mad I lost that game, too. Oh, you did? Yeah, we played good. We did good. That was, yeah. Which ball? It was the Holiday Bowl, oh, great fun ball. game. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun game. He caught a touchdown pass. They threw, I think, a quarterback throwback to him. Really? Yep. That was cool. So Chris um, Sims against uh, Joey, Joey Harrington. Harrington. I, yep. I, I threw an interception late in the game. What route? I think it was an in-cut, like a six in-cut. I threw a backer or safety. Really late. It was a safety, drove Came on up, it. Yeah. We had already blown our opportunity. I threw four strikes into the end zone the series before. Yeah. And all four were dropped Uh-oh. in four consecutive plays. There was three consecutive plays. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, that pissed me off. I can still remember that was one of my first games of, uh, I think I might have told you this before, but they ran like the same play the whole game. Mm. We were Texas and we were more athletic, so yeah. we played man to man every play. Yeah. Every play. Yeah. And they ran two crossers underneath, and he threw the five yard crosser, and he ran for 20 yards every play the Did whole game. Did you go game. down and talk to the D coordinator? So we scored a touchdown to take the lead yeah. late in the game. Yeah. And I'm coming off the sidelines, uh -oh. uh -oh. and I Mac is there, and yeah. I go, Coach, you got to tell them to stop playing man to man every play. Yeah. And he lit, like you know lit into me like, hey, you just worry about what you got to do with all this. And I <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I had never done that before, but I think I was so competitive, wanted to win the game. You're feeling good about that. I touchdown. wanted to be Joey yeah. Harrington, you know, yeah. all of that thing. And Joey Harrington's damn you know banner was in my city here in New York, so I was like, I got to get this guy off of these buildings and get me on there. <laughs> That's right, it was <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So it was personal. I was like, I want to take this down. 91 Holiday Bowl. We played against Ty Detmer. Oh. Heisman Trophy. How many did you throw for 900 yards against you it guys that game? It was a 10-10 tie back what? when they were ties. Yeah, I don't know. It was an ugly, How weird. How could he have that? I, I thought know. he threw for 500 yards every game, I feel like. Especially in the Holiday Bowl. Like BYU was, was scoring <laughs> like 70 points every one of those <laughs> right, games. Right. Okay, that brings us to 400. All signs point to Lawrence Wilson going 1-2. Yep. Quarterbacks going 1-2. Not uncommon. Goff Wentz. Winston Mariota, Luck RG3, Peyton Leaf. 1993, my senior year in college, also saw quarterbacks picked at one and two. What quarterbacks to what teams? It's a tough one. So 93, you is that Bledsoe old. and Rick Meyer? There it is. Damn. Yeah. Right after Boom. I said it's a tough Boom. one. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. That's prime Chris Sims knowledge right there. It's the end of Big Phil's career. I feel like I know everything yeah. that went on in that area. That right was there. kind of a big decision too. Like that wasn't an automatic. Yes. I mean, in the end, I think it was, you know, Bledsoe yeah, was obvious, right, but right. Like maybe they were on the cover or something as you know, who do you pick? No, or? it was, it was definitely that Manning yeah. Leaf kind of like, who's the number one pick. And of course, you know, Meyer being from Notre Dame had that hype around yeah. him. And they're just like, what? This guy's from Washington State? Yeah. Uh, man, but Bledsoe could throw that oh, ball. Oh, my goodness. Ooh, man, he had a cannon. <sighs> Crazy. He really did. All right, 500. Only twice in NFL draft history have the top three picks been all QBs. 99, Tim Couch, Donovan McNabb, Achilles Smith. Achilles Smith, right. And 71. Who was the first overall pick in 1971? And Pete reworked this. The way I had it, I think it was easier. Pete made it Pete's tougher. an asshole. I mean, we know that. Yeah. All yeah. right. Wait. Hold on a second. I, I it's know not it's a not. nobody. I'm just going to. I mean, because 71, I'm thinking it's that's not. Archie Manning was two. Okay. Dan Pastorini was three. Right. That's, that's so number good two one, and three. Number one. I know. Potential Hall of Famer. Like, is that, that's, Multiple that's. Multiple teams. He, all right, so wait, I'm, I'm right. So I know, because I'm thinking like Bradshaw was a little before that. Yeah. And then Stallback wasn't then. And then, so this goes to Jim Plunkett. There it is. Boom. Just five for five. I think you've done it a couple times. Boom, ba -da boom. Five for woo, five. Woo, woo, woo. Jim Plunkett. That's, that's the way to finish. Yeah. Woo, woo. <laughs> she, she's like, what did I walk into? Jim here? Plunkett. Yeah. yeah. Um. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? Come That's on. what I always say. Two Everybody always says it's two Super Bowls gets you in the Hall of Fame, except for Jim Plunkett. Except for that him. It's going to get Eli Manning in. Well, I, I, I understand that, but those were some shitty teams, too. I, well, yeah, he got, he got he pigeonholed well. into a shitty situations early in his career, and yeah. So, yeah. it, it, he won two Super Bowls. So, did Joe Namath. Joe yeah. Namath threw more interceptions. He did. I know. He's in. I know. It's just, again, I, Pete, I understand what you're saying. I get it. But th this is... We're going to see Eli get in. Yeah, right. And it's just going to be about the two-game stretch, really. Right. You know, and that's just, you know, again, I, yeah. Jim Plunkett, I think, is better than what people will ever give him totally credit agree. for. He was on shitty teams. Totally he agree. had no help. So he got with the Raiders, and you saw what he could do. I'm glad Tom Flores finally got it. I know, right? Jeez. We don't have time for this last question, I don't think. But oh, I just want more? you to ponder it from oh. Frank Knowles before we go away. Frank Knowles. I don't have a defensive tackle draft question. I would like Chris to do a top five ranking of his coworkers. Oh. <laughs> but we're out of time. Out of time. Well, come back to us next week. You think week. about that when you're driving home. I, I will. Okay? I will. All right. Florio's, Florio's five. If Don't you worry. want to put me at two instead of one, I, I, I would understand. You're in the top two for sure. Okay. Oh, thank you. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, Pete's honorable mention. Pete, 
Pete's down the list. Pete would be the guy, be like, okay, a couple guys that didn't make the cut. Uh, Pete Delamba. Chris, Kristen's towards the top of the list, too. Kristen might really be number she one. She might be number one. I mean, she's just like got a great way about her. She's never flustered. Is Florio on She's not mention? annoying. Like, she, yeah. she gives me great movie recommendations and shows always, and all I that. Know, yeah. Hey, she's just always, she's the same girl every day. Same woman. Sorry, what I don't know. What more can you ask for? But yeah, same I, I, I really respect that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, keep, don't He's, do it. Uh, and yeah, Florio's honorable mention. Who the hell can deal with him? I mean, can you, they need to pay me more. I have to talk to him four times a week for two hours each time. <laughs> it's, it's torture. <laughs> all right, that's it. Chris Sims, Pauly Burmeister, Chris Sims on Button. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. You know I'm going to continue to crack through this. I got more positions coming up next week. I still got tight ends, running backs, and linebackers nice. on my docket. So I'm just starting to crack through those. I'll be doing that all weekend. Please continue to send the questions. I love doing that stuff. I love the interaction. Um, and we'll hit on all the NFL current news as we go along here, too. Pauly, you well the done. man. Thanks a lot. Fun. Good one. Peace out. Everybody be good. Talk to you next week. Yo, yo, what's up? Come on, man. Subscribe on YouTube to Chris Sims Unbutton Podcast. I need you. Please hit the subscribe button, please. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.